All right, Shalom. Welcome to the Keys to Equity uh, module number three. For those of you who were not able to make it to our two previous modules, uh, my name is Dominic Green. I'm the program manager for the Keys to Equity ADU program uh, provided to you all by Richmond Neighborhood Housing Services. Super excited to be working with each of you. Um, I have a lot of uh, important updates to provide you all um, throughout the presentation. So I'm excited that you were able to join. Again, this is being recorded. So if you miss anything or you're not sure about something, you will get this recording sent out to you all. Uh, and if you have anyone that you know that couldn't make it tonight, let us know and we'll make sure they get the recording as well. Okay. Um, but if they've already RSVP for a previous session, um, they will still get this recording regardless. So welcome. Okay. Yep. And we'll have folks coming into the room uh, throughout the presentation. I know it's right after working hours. So I appreciate you all making time to come this evening. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about how to work with your general contractor and architect as it pertains to building your accessory dwelling unit. The last week we talked about financing your ADU and the week before that was our first week and we did a program overview where we really uh, introduced what services are available to you all, right? Uh, next week we'll do modules four and five together. We'll talk about managing tenants and landlord legalities. Super important that you don't miss that session. Uh, I would say this session is equally as is, is, is equally important. We have lower numbers today compared to the previous two sessions. So I'm going to send a reminder out to folks who have been coming to keep coming because uh, as the sessions go along, they get more and more important in my opinion. So thank you all for oh, coming. I, I had a problem logging on. I had to use the one that Norva had sent directly instead of Eventbrite. Thank you, Julius. So that's a good heads up for myself. Um, so I'll make sure that you all are able to get those links and you you don't have the same difficulties logging on. And Julius, you said you got the, the link that Norveen sent out for RCP today, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, that's what that's what got me in. Not the um, Eventbrite that I tried to get in. Got it. Okay, so I'll make sure we, we fix that and that the Eventbrite and the link that Norveen is sending you, it, it takes you to the same location. Thanks for that heads up, Julius. Cool. So again, thank you all for joining us. We'll go ahead and, and dive in. Uh, thank you, Julius. Come off mute if you all have more things to, to uh, inquire about or, or, or um, express concerns about. I really appreciate that. Okay. Cool. Uh, so today, you know, as it pertains to general contractors, architects, and your accessory dwelling units, we're going to be discussing um, what you should know about managing and betting and hiring the general contractor, right? As a part of that, we'll also talk about uh, what is a lawsuit as it pertains to that relationship, how to file a complaint, right? We'll talk about what is a, a lien, uh, a mechanics lien is the example we'll, we'll use today, right? We're not talking about financial liens like first or second lien mortgage products. We're talking about actual mechanics liens, which we'll dive into in the presentation. Uh, aside from that, we'll dive into basic architect information, right? What is an architect, how to shop for one, where you can find one, uh, what do you need to be prepared to discuss when you find one you think you like um, and how they interface with inspectors? Uh, what are the different payment structures they, they use? How to protect yourselves in those relationships? Um, there's a typo here, but working with the drafts person is something else we'll cover. I'm not going to say too much about that, but a drafts person is very similar to an architect, but they're not licensed. So we'll talk about the different responsibilities they can hold to support you. And then we'll talk about insurance requirements. So um, seems like a whole lot, but I wouldn't say it's too much for the time limit. All right, any questions about the overview? Okay. All right, let's keep going. And remember, you can just come off mute or put your questions in the chat box if you have those for tonight, since it's just myself. Uh, so working with the contractor, what should you know? So let's start with the pros and cons of using the contractor. I always tell you all this. Anytime you see a list of pros and cons from me, it's never the end to be all. These are just from my experience, which you might run across, right? So some of the pros, they could be well-versed in the laws. And mind you, I say they can be. They may not always be well-versed, okay? So we'll talk about when you're vetting a contractor, um, how to do that to combat this a little bit, but in general, some of the pros are they, they're usually well-versed in the laws of construction, 
just not always, right? So I said they can be. Um, they may save you time, right? That's another pro. They should be saving you time. That's That should be one of the reasons you hire a general contractor. It's just not always. Sometimes you run across a general contractor who's not very well versed in ways to save you time, okay? But that's something we have to be able to identify early on so we can save money. Some more pros, they can maintain good records, right? Can because sometimes they can get sloppy, right? So you should also maintain your own records, which is something we'll dive into later on in the presentation, but they should be maintaining good records to support you, all right? Because they have to be the ones who respond to the building and planning department along with the architects, right? We'll talk about what that relationship looks like uh, between the contractor architect and the building and planning departments for the cities in a moment, okay? Another pro, they can help you create a project scope, right? For many of you who have uh, who don't have a good picture or idea of what you want your accessory dwelling unit to look like, or you know whether that be how large it is, how much more footage, the type of amenities to include, the general contractor should be skilled enough to support you in coming up with what that looks like. Okay. And if they can't, well, then you shouldn't spend the money on that, right? And I've sort of mentioned this um, already, but they will be experienced with your city's building and planning departments. Every city has a, build, uh, a building and planning department that your development or your construction idea or concept will have to get vetted through. Okay, and what happens is, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, uh, your general contractors or architects take your plans and your design, they submit those to the city, right? And uh, out there maybe four weeks, three or four weeks or maybe a month or longer, what we're seeing, the city will respond. So that'll be the building or planning department will respond to that architect or contractor. And they'll ask questions about the design, about the different nuts and bolts of what the plans say that you all came up with. Um, and they'll line that up against law, legalities for the city, right? Uh, and they may ask your contractor to give them comments back on that design or that scope of work. Uh, and it is their responsibility to do so, okay? And it's not your job to do that. So that's that's why it's a pro. Or your contractor or architect should be able to do that for sure the contractor. Sometimes it's the architect, but at least the contractor should be able to manage your communications with the building and planning departments of your city, right? Now, some cons, they might be expensive. All contractors have their own hourly rate for work. And that goes along with the cost of uh, the cost to build in a city, right? It may cost you 450 bucks a square foot to build in Oakland. And when you go to Stockton, it maybe cost you 300. Well, your contractor's hourly rate is probably the same regardless of where they're building. So um, they may be expensive. It just depends on the contractor. So you want to always get two to three quotes, right? Regardless of how much you like the contractor's architect. So that's something we'll talk more about later. Another con, um, it, you know, even though you hire a general contractor, they still may require some additional oversight. I know that doesn't sound fun or it doesn't sound exciting. It sounds like, well, why would we hire a general contractor if they're going to require additional oversight? Well, the reality of it is, you know, they're human. Okay. And sometimes we get sloppy, sometimes they get tired. Um, so it, it helps to have a second pair of eyes, you know, to remind them of what their, their responsibilities are. Right. And you may not need to be so pressing on them. OK, but you want to at least be ready to be um, so things don't, you know, end up costing you more than they should. Right. What if the for example, what if uh, the city of Oakland's building department responds to your set of designs in which they'd be responding to your contractor and they're asking a set of questions that they need a response for by back by. Right. If your contract is not on their game, they're not going to be able to do that or respond on time, right? And uh, you should be CC'd on those communications. You should be aware of what's happening in that relationship, right? So you may need to remind them, hey, I saw this email. Uh, when are we planning to respond? There's a, a deadline, right? Not always, but this is just something that as, as the key equity program, we want to illuminate for you all, right? Contractors aren't perfect. No one is. So um, sometimes that helps. Another con potentially is that they may not communicate project status effectively. Something else I thought about, right? Um, all contractors have their own individual experiences with various projects, 
right? So they may not always be aware of where you prefer to be communicated to. So I would say early on in that relationship when you're vetting your contractors to be sure to let them know what things you wanna be updated around or updated on uh, throughout the project, okay? And some of the things that I would like to, I would say you all should wanna be updated on are obviously project timelines, any things like change orders. And we'll talk about what a change order is in a moment. Uh, any issues they're having with materials, right? There are, I'm sure there are, are, are numerous amounts of things you'd like to get communicated to you all as a homeowner, you know, as it pertains to working with a contractor. Okay. And again, if you have questions, um, feel free to come off mute or, or, or drop them in the chat box. And if I see it pop up, I'll pause and address your question the best I can. Right. Okay, shopping for a contractor. Of course, I would start with word of mouth, as always, right? Talk to your friends and family, uh, coworkers, neighbors, whomever you know may be experienced with that type of work and ask if they can point you in the right direction. It's a great place to start. A lot of times the most reputable person is someone we trust, right? And that we've had, we've built uh, a relationship with in some way. So start there, okay? And that's gonna give you some references. Um, look at sites you trust that post ratings and reviews. So we'll, when we say sites, we're referring to online websites, houses.com, you'll see that listed here. The uh, contractors licensing boards, another place you can find folks, Craigslist, there are a lot of places you can find contractors online and you can, and we're saying really look at their ratings and reviews right before you go ahead and, and trust those sites. Uh, something else you can also do is when you believe you vetted a contractor and you like them, ask them for references, right? And that's what the second bullet points are mentioning. Ask them for references and you can call those references and ask how was your experience with this contractor? Uh, something else we didn't list here, but I think, I know it's a great idea. Aside from calling their references, also contact their subcontractors and ask about their experiences with the general contractor because that'll give you some insights uh, to what your experience might be like, right? And uh, of course, while you're shopping for a contractor, get estimates. That's the whole reason why you'd be uh, speaking to a contractor more than likely, all right? Um, yeah, and then we'll talk more about their licensing qualifications, things you should check for. There's actually a resource I'll share with you all this week after tonight, um, a checklist of items you should be reviewing in terms of their licensing. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, common, <clears throat> common homeowner concerns when working with a contractor. Uh, again, this list can be ever flowing, but these are a few that have come up the most in our experiences, quality of work, right? Although you, you're gonna work with them to develop a scope of work, things can happen. Again, they're not perfect. You know, it may be, it, it's the, the time of day they started the job, who knows? But quality of work can be, can be an issue, okay? And we'll talk about what um, a follow-up to that can look like for you all. Timing of the project, delays, that will, that can and probably will happen. I will say, especially with the current, uh, economic outlook. I mean, I'll just say that, right? Maybe, I'll, well, I'll put it this way, right? Uh, I would say in 2021, ma the majority of contractors would have told you building an ADU would be four to six months, right? Which can seem, which may be pretty fast for some of you, right? Now it may be doubled to eight months, right? And that may not be because of the contractor. It can easily be because of their access to materials now, right? They all have their own material vendors, their own, uh, and that means like wood vendors, uh, metal dealers that they work with. Uh, and that affects the contractor's timeline, right? That affects whether or not there are delays, change orders. So be prepared for that. Uh, and this goes along with rising costs. Right, this goes along with changes to scope of project, and that's really a change order, right? And then payment disputes. Uh, hopefully, you don't experience this, and you shouldn't if you have a contract drawn, which is something we'll talk about. But payment disputes happen more frequently uh, when there's no contract between yourselves and the contractors, or even the architects, right? Um, I mean, they it would still have to be pretty bad for that to happen, but it can't. 
Okay. Uh, so this is what I, I just sort of mentioned, right? Your proposed agreement or your contract with the contractor should be in writing. Um, here we're saying California requires it. it. It's not really required, but for our program, we're making it a requirement, right? We would never recommend you all do work with the contractor or the architect without having it in writing in a formal way, okay? Um, and, and within, within that agreement, some items you're gonna ensure uh, you don't, some things you're gonna ensure you don't do, right? Is you're not gonna, within the written agreement, put in account numbers, bank numbers, social security numbers. You're gonna explain who, what, what workers do what work and what workers should be touching, what parts of the project. Uh, and you're gonna be talking about change orders, right? What changes should be in writing. So um, we highly recommend you all use a contract. We would never recommend you all not. Okay, cool. And again, this goes back to one of the pros early on is that contractors should be keeping good records, but they may not always, okay? Uh, so save everything the contractor sends you, keep copies of anything you send them, and write down the dates, times, and notes for every call or house visit, all right? And actually, give me a second. I want to make sure you all see this correctly. Just got a message. Okay, we're good. Sorry about that, y'all. I'm going to go back to share my screen. Okay. Back to it. So yeah, if there's any uh, any other concerns, go ahead and just drop those in the chat. Thank you for that. Uh, again, keep good records. Your, your general contractor should be keeping good records, but a lot of times they may not. All right, so you should be keeping your own copies of documents that you sign. Save everything the contractor sends you. That includes emails. Um, and it's okay to have phone conversations with them, but if they, if you can email, you know, go ahead and do that, okay? Especially when you're discussing pertinent information, or if you discuss it over the phone, ask them to send you a follow-up email for your records, and they should be able to do that. Okay. Scam alerts. There are a lot of scams out there, and I've been at the, 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 the bad end of a few, right? So scam alerts. Um, you should all... You should always vet your contractor's license number. If it's expired, I would inquire about it, right? You shouldn't work with them for building your ADU, but if it's, uh, I mean, in general, if you're just looking to get your cabinets built, maybe you like the person, you might, but it, in general, it's better for them to be licensed. Ask them why they're unlicensed right now. Maybe they'll say, you know, uh, I get enough business without needing to be. And what, they, They'll all have the different reasons, but you need to understand what the reasons are and make sure you're okay with those. But as it pertains to putting your ADU, they should be licensed. Let me tell you what, what can happen if uh, they're not licensed, right? Similar to, to you all not getting your units permitted. If they're not licensed and the city finds out, well, that means that there was no, no document signed off by the city for the contractor to do that work. So they potentially could have you tear it down. And let's say you already rented it out. Well, and you, and let's say you go into a rental agreement with a tenant, right? Well, now you have to tear the structure down, kick the tenant out, right? And then now the tenant can potentially sue you for breaking your rental agreement. And so I mean, there's a lot of different things that can happen, right? So in general, get your projects permitted and also make sure the folks that are doing this work are licensed. That's like the bare minimum, right? Uh, another uh, scam that's been happening, some unlicensed workers will hand out cars that are falsified. So again, just check the license numbers on those cards. We'll, we'll talk about how to do that. Uh, and, a lot, and a lot of times this happens door to door. Okay. Um, another, another piece of this is to not let someone uh, find financing for you who's a contractor. That, that's, been a, that's been fairly common, though, I will say. I'm not sure if you all know about the PACE program, which is something that came out years ago. And they had folks who did like solar installation and uh major projects like that they had 
those contractors selling the financing for the job. Right. And I was going to actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, You said the contractor finance some of the projects or they fund like subsidies like solar. Right. So for the PACE program, what was happening is the there was there were individual lenders providing the actual financing for it. But the contractors who partnered with those lenders were selling the programs, right, uh, to get you to go into a relationship with, let's say, I mean, like a Guild Mortgage or Wells Fargo, in hopes of you accepting them, bringing them on for the project, right? So the contractors weren't financing anything. They were uh, selling the financing tool to, to homeowners, right? And the financing was provided by the bank still. Um, but the bank's idea was, okay, let's, let's tell our contractors about the program and have them sell it to homeowners that they meet with in the field. It really backfired. So it didn't work out at all. And the PACE program is no longer, right? Um, but they were doing it door to door. So it, a lot of folks considered it predatory, I will say, uh, programs like that. So it's no longer. Um, and again, the contractors weren't providing you funding. They were just trying to get you to work with a certain bank to go through that program so you could accept them to do your job. Or which was like put up solar uh, and other major projects like that. Hopefully that, that makes sense or uh, it answers your question. Uh, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. It, that's kind of crazy, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, no, uh, a lot, like I said, it's no longer and it was very short lived. And I brought it up on the scam page because a lot of folks considered it predatory. Um, because I know myself personally, I didn't do it because they were going to add on a, uh, an additional lien to my home. So uh, it wasn't something I was going to do financially at the time. Not that, you know, that's going to be the case for everyone. So be, we, we be wary of that. Sometimes you'll have a little more knowledge than the person who's telling you about the product. Okay. And you'll certainly know more about your individual financial situation, what, your, what type of risk you're, you're willing to endure. Okay. So uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what happens if the contractor walks off the job? Do you got to pay them? What happens if you don't pay? Very simple. The reality of it is uh, everything should be in the contract, right? So uh, the contractor should do all the work that you that you all agreed with them to do, all right? Um, and you have to pay for that work, okay? Uh, even if it wasn't completed, you still need to pay, right? Well, I'm sorry. If they don't complete the work, you no longer need to pay, but there is a set of steps I would take uh, in that case. And we'll talk about that later in the presentation. Um, but in general, if you sign a contract, if they complete the work, regardless of whether or not you like the quality, you should still pay them, right? Okay, you should still pay them. Uh, and then there's a set of things you can can go down, a set of steps you can take um, to recuperate some of those funds or to get them all back, right? But in general, you have to abide by your contracts. And that goes for the contractors as well. That's why we, we say you should definitely draft them up, okay? And if they walk off the job, they, they, they will have to, we'll talk about it more in the presentation, but they will, uh, you'll have a case against them, of course. They can't just walk off the job and take your money. That's not uh, reality. Is it best to set the contract up in phases or uh, per completions? Great uh, question. I would say draft the contract in its entirety. Don't break it into phases. What is broken into phases is that draw schedule with the lender and contractor and yourself. Then you'll know, and that and that will be discussed within the contract, right? You'll know uh, what amounts of money are going to be dispersed from the lender to the contractor and when, right? But all of that should be written out in the schedule within the overall contract. So um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I wouldn't do multiple contracts, right? It should be one contract, right? And then within that one contract, you, you should talk about individual draw schedules between the lenders, uh, your lender, uh, and your contractors. Okay. All right. So this is these are some more steps you can take, right? Um, what if you want to see your contract? Right. These are some questions you need to ask yourselves. Do you have a good case? Are you comfortable with the idea of a compromise settlement or going to mediation? That can draw your project schedule out and cost more money. Um, and assuming a lawsuit is your best option, can you collect if you win? Now, I will tell you this. These are not questions I would say you can answer alone. You need to contact us 
uh, Rich Neighborhood Housing Services and myself as the program manager for the Keys Equity Program. If you experience this within the program, you should not, right? But if you do, you should definitely follow up with us because we can connect you to those state attorneys. That's who you want to talk to, okay? And obviously, we'll help you consult around this before that. But if it comes down to you having a case, well, a real estate attorney is your, is your person that you want to address these questions with. And we'll support you to do that. Okay. So what is a lawsuit in real estate, right? Typically, um, it's a dispute involving real property, such as your ADU, your primary residence, so your, your home, right? Um, and a lot of the issues that lawsuits for real estate are filed around are foreclosures, mortgage disputes, um, property title uh, disputes, zoning and boundary line, land, land use issues, right? But also for you all, uh, timeline disputes, right? Ensuring that there's no uh, additional money you have to put up because the contractor's slacking on the work that they're doing, right? Anything like that is being done against your contract, meaning if you drew it up in the contract and, and the work that the contractor uh, puts forth goes against it, you potentially have a case, right? Um, and I'm not an attorney, but I would always recommend that you, if you feel this way, that you follow up with the, our sales so we can connect you to attorney if you don't already have that, okay? The real estate attorney is going to be the person to let you know whether or not you actually have a lawsuit, right? Cool. But I will say more times than not, if you're experiencing a, an issue with a contractor or an architect, um, the law will be more than likely on your side, right? Just like if you sue a business, um, they're going to go through their due diligence, but more than likely, you know, from the jump, you're going to be, the, the customers are going to be looked at as the, the party to uh, support the most. So just know that, right? Okay. And again, I would always come to us if you have questions about a lawsuit. Hopefully it never gets to this point, but you, you always have this option, right? And, and you more than likely will be able to uh, potentially win this dispute. So do we have a list of vetted contractors and architects? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So that, that is uh, something we should definitely illuminate. Um, if you all do not have any architects or contractors, we have those within the program, right? But also we want to invite you all to leverage the ones that you feel most comfortable with, right? Uh, now that's a checklist we'll run down with whoever you all decide to work with, okay? But if it's someone that we are recommending that we've already uh, checked things off on that list. So yes. Great question, certainly. Okay. Okay. So what is a C um, SLB complaint? All right. California State Licensing Board. So this is something that I would write down or just wait until the email goes out after uh, and you'll get a link to their website. But uh, this is where you're going to be able to complain about contractors and, and uh, really general contractors for the most part, right, for you all. Um, and this pertains to threats to public health or safety. It, 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 uh, it, it doesn't just have to be your general contractors. Either it can be their subcontractors, meaning their electricians, the farmers, whoever they bring on to do the work. Okay, but this board is going to be able to vet of that complaint and work with their attorney, uh, you know, to decide whether there was a failure to do something. Right. And I think one thing that can potentially come up for you all is poor worksmanship. Right. Like I said, the quality of work, leaving the, the project, the benefit of project. Right. Those things can, will result in a lawsuit and a CSLB complaint. And this can, if the complaint stands, it'll go on the contractor's license. So any future person that tries to work with this individual will see it. And it'll be a huge, the, the biggest red flag. Okay. What is a mechanics lien? So this is uh, an issue on your end, right? Uh, this is if you just, you don't pay your contract. Let's say the contractor or the subcontractor, the electrician, the plumber, whoever, they come and do some work, right? Um, and they're left unpaid, okay? They could potentially, or if they use the contract, uh, place a mechanics lien on your property, which allows them to take your home uh, and the, uh, to put your home in, in foreclosure action, potentially, right? Forcing the sale of property in lieu of compensation. So they can take you to court and say, hey, if you don't pay me, uh, 
I can take your property. And that doesn't matter if the mechanics is 40,000, your home's almost paid off, right? They can place a mechanics lien on your property, right? These will hold up in court because they're recorded with the county's recorder's office. Okay, so these are very serious. I don't think any of you are ever gonna have this issue, right? Because you're gonna be drawing up contracts, you're going to be paying these folks on a schedule, but these, these are things that can happen. Right? Uh, what is an arbitration clause? Let's read this, right? An arbitration is an out-of-court proceeding in which a neutral party called an arbitrator Here's evidence that makes a binding decision, okay? Uh, and in general, arbitration is the most commonly used dispute resolution method, right? Uh, so really, this is means in all of your contracts with your contractors, there's going to be verbiage that discusses what happens if there's an issue, right? Someone's, going, we're going to say, for example, it could be like, if you and I did disagree on project costs after we sign the contract, right? Then we'll go to this individual, this court to handle the dispute, right? Or we'll just go to court. That'll be in the contract, right? We won't try to handle it amongst ourselves. Uh, but this, this explains who is the neutral third party that's going to handle this, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Uh, so all general contractors will have a contractor's bond, and this is not uh, like insurance. So they'll have insurance and they'll have a bond, okay? Um, if there is arbit an arbitration issue in which you have to have a mutual third party who operates like a court a step in, or if there is, if you actually have to go to court and do those proceedings, a lot of times that money the contractor has to pay out uh, comes out of their contractor's bond, Right, so there are different requirements in different cities for the amount of the bond that the contractors must hold. Uh, for the contractors that we be referring to you all, they all we, we've had to ensure that they have this. But after today, you're going to get a list of requirements that they should be as it pertains to their bond and insurance. Uh, so you can always look at that list of requirements and ensure that they can check those off. Right, but they, they'll have to pay out of this bond if there's an issue. Like, let's say they owe you all twenty thousand dollars; it's going to come out of their bond. Right. Cool. All right. Uh, and, and so now we're talking more about, you know, oh, some folks are coming in. More predatory construction, uh, construction loan offers, not construction loan offers, more, more predatory general contractor uh, construction offers, right? More folks that are trying to trick you all to get you all to work with them. Um, and I will say some of the things on this list can come up if you've already hired a general contractor, you think they're really good, these should be some red flags or warning signs, right, that you will come across and work with them. And you may need to speak to a real estate attorney, follow up with us as a, the program's manager, right, if it happens within the program, okay? Uh, but some of those, those warning signs and red flags, the contractor knocks on your door for business. I understand why folks may think this is a red flag, but it's not a an always red flag, right? Uh, door knocking is super popular now. Uh, contractors don't typically door knock a lot. They will come by though and place cards, uh, you know, on your property or on your door screen or you know near your mailbox. I've seen that, right? But I've never uh, really experienced contractors door knocking. Um, so I mean, I guess if they are door knocking listen to the conversation if it interests you, but know what you're listening to, right? I'm not sure exactly what, I mean, it can happen. Maybe you might have a great contractor that comes to your door and they see you have room for an ADU and they want to raise that idea. It just doesn't happen very often. A lot of times they're just providing, give you information about their services, right? So all the folks in the neighborhood, that's that's typically normal, right? And that's, that's great. Um, now, if that person who knocks on your door is pressuring you for an immediate decision, red flag. No one should ever pressure you to spend your money up front really quickly. And we would never encourage that within our program, right? Um, you all know this. One of our biggest resources that we offer within the program are our construction loans. We're never going to force you all to take those loans. We can't do that, right? Uh, we, we're not going to be steering you in any direction, and neither should your general contractor. 
even if they're talking about the uh, access to well and unit design, they shouldn't be steering you towards any direction unless it's better off for you financially and in the long run. It shouldn't be better off for them and there's no win for you, okay? Um, also, if your contractor is demanding cash only payments, big red flag, that's not normal. If your contractor met, uh, demands any payments up front, big red flag, not normal. Uh, if they want to be your contractor and your financer, red flag, it's not normal. It happens though. Uh, there are programs and there are contractors who are becoming innovative and they're trying to provide the financing and do the building, but you have to know, you know what those programs are. Um, and if they come to you with that, do you do your due diligence before signing anything? All right, that's what I would say. Uh, another warning sign, uh, if they're telling you that you have to go get the building and, and planning permits instead of themselves, huge red flag. That is a big role of a contractor uh, or architect, right? It's to follow up the building department, the planning department, and get your permits approved. That is not your job unless you're not working with the contractor, which we wouldn't always recommend for this type of work. Okay? Uh, and then if they give you a lifetime warranty or some type of long-term guarantee, you never seen it, it's a, it should be a red flag to you all. I've seen typically a year's worth of warranty after it works. So they may be a to you, give you a year's worth of warranty to address any concerns with the build, boom, which is fair. And that's typically in mind what we see on the market. The lifetime warranty, that's crazy. Uh, it puts them at way too much risk, right, to offer those. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to stop. Are there any questions before we start to talk about uh, architects more so now? That's a little bit about general contractors. And we're going to talk more about architects. Right? Okay, so again, if you have more questions, pop them in the chat. And come off mute. Okay. So what do architects do? Right? So I will say this. So before we dive into this, let me say this, you all. Many of the general contractors... Many of these general contracting agencies that you all run across are called design build organizations. All right, design build, meaning they have general contractors and builders, but in house on their team, they also have architects. Not all organizations work that way. Sometimes they're just a general contractor, and sometimes they're just an architect. They work individually, and you have to be able to vet each individually and bring them together to build your project. Uh, if you work with one of the contractors that we can refer you to, well, they they will more than likely be a design build contractor. I mean, they have in-house architects to support you. So you don't have to worry about that. But if you are gonna be using your own contractor, you wanna make sure that you know whether or not they have an architect in-house. We'll help you vet that. If you wanna bring us some folks and help you vet them, we can do that too. Uh, but that is something that you should know, right? But right now we're gonna just be talking about architects. So what do architects do, right? And why should you use them for your project? You should, you should use both the contractor and architect, right? Uh, but what do the architects do specifically? They help you with the actual project project design and give you that cost estimate. Uh, and they'll work with the contract to give you the complete cost estimate. But for the contractor, you know, uh, to give you an estimate, they need to be speaking to an architect around design. So the architects help with the project design. Um, I mean, this includes the, the different slope and different elevations and different amenities you want to see or the different, and the different features of your current landscaping, right? A good architect designs for your individual uniqueness. So they're not going to be bringing a blanket design to you and saying, hey, I just used this on seven projects. Well, that's not super valuable and they may not even work out for the homeowner, you all, right? They should be like, again, uh, supporting your architect in the, that site assessment um, before, you know, coming up with the design, okay? So there's measurements and you have to work with a project engineer to do that as well, right? Uh, but yeah, those things are, that, that's a part of what they would be doing, right? Uh, and doing this ahead of time is going to save you all money. It can, otherwise it can result in a lot of change orders, changes in design, Anytime there's a lot of changes in design during construction, that means that the architect didn't do a great job of something, right? Uh, or maybe the contractor didn't do a good job of managing their in-house architect. Or maybe we didn't do a good job of managing our, our architect or, or vetting them when we brought them on. 
right? Um, project design, right? That includes, again, mapping, listing out construction materials. And this is why that conversation with the contractors and our, between the contractors and architects are important because uh, that's gonna affect how the final unit looks, right? And also what that final estimate looks like for you, right? The more conversations your architect has with your general contractor, the more uh, accurate your estimate is gonna be, even though it's just an estimate before construction starts, okay? And as a part of that estimate, you should be getting permitting fees. Now, permitting, permitting fees can vary um, depending on your design. So that's why the architect will be able to help with that. Where to shop for an architect? These are not the only places, right? These are just some of the obvious places that you might think of. Online, houses.com, upwork.com. I've actually found an architect on there who was really, really good, who built a two-story deck. Uh, and the California Architects Board, right? Again, Craigslist, word of mouth. There are a bunch of places you can find architects, but a big one are general contractors. They all, they'll always have a recommendation for an architect. Okay. Be careful though, because it may be one that they're friends with and really close with and might be a little more expensive, you know. Um, but I'll say this if it's a general contractor that you really like, it may suit you well to work with an architect that they recommend or they're familiar with, because that means it could potentially speed the timeline of your project up. Not always, right? But it's something that uh, you want to think about. Um, and you should still be vetting your architects, which is something we're going to talk more about. Now, when you're shopping for an architect, what should you be prepared to tell them, right? What you're trying to build, of course, uh, where you're trying to build it, although they may already know uh, what your goals are with the project. Are you planning on building it for uh, as a rental? Are you planning on building it as a flip and selling it, right? They want to know all those different things, um, how your current primary residence is being used, uh, and the Nello Press got to California landlord tenant law. So that's something that I, we're going to share with you all in the, the resources after this, right? But you want to definitely let them know that you understand. Uh, well, now that you understand tenant law, but whether or not you're going to be renting out uh, your space to a tenant, right? There are certain desi design features an architect needs to be aware of, okay, um, before they start to build your project if you're going to be renting it out because that's going to be affects your relationship as a homeowner with, with the city's uh, writ board, right? If you're going to be renting it out to tenants. Okay, so as it pertains to what you're trying to build, you should mention, obviously, that the project is an ADU. It's an accessory dwelling unit. It's not 2,000 square feet, you know? And also, you should let them know about the concept uh, about ADUs. Um, they should be familiar with it if you're, you know, choosing them, but if you're vetting, going through the vetting process, you don't know yet if they're familiar with ADUs, right? So you have to gauge that once you say it's an accessory dwelling unit and then explain the concept. Is it a garage conversion? Do you want it in your backyard detached, right? Do you want uh, an addition to the home, second level? You, you want them to know those items, okay? Where you're trying to build. So as it pertains to where, again, is it in the backyard? Is it a garage conversion, existing structure, okay? Question. Hmm. Great question. So is there a scale of cost for architectural services like blueprints, et cetera? Uh, I will share, I will create one and share it with you all after today. Um, there's no scale that I've seen like posted anywhere, but from my experience in working with architects, if you're just like hiring a flat out architect, meaning they're, they're not teamed up with the general contractor, uh, on average, it could cost, depending on the scale of your project, uh, it can be between six to six to fourteen thousand. Well, I'm gonna say six to fifteen thousand. Obviously, yeah, six to fifteen thousand, and it can cost a little more, a little less, depending on what they're designing. Um, and that's for an architect because an architect is licensed, right? And uh, I gave such a wide range because it really depends on the work. I will say, I just had. Uh, well, last year, I did the two-story deck in Richmond, the city of Richmond, and uh, just for the architect services, and it was pretty affordable. He lived in Richmond. It was 12000 right? Now, this deck acted as an entryway to three units, though, so they had to uh, build that concept into the design, right, because we have to incorporate certain seismic features, okay? 
Uh, so should, it, it could have potentially been a little less, right? I've, I had quotes for like 10,000, 11,000, but we ended up paying 12. Uh, but to give you a range, I'd say six to, to 15, depending on the design, especially for something like an ADU, it, it won't be uh, that much. And then a lot of times, to let you know this, it is cheaper to work with an architect if they are working on a design build team. Meaning if the architects on the team with the contract you wanna work with, well, then you'll probably get a discount on their services. Um, it is more expensive to work with a flat out architect than it is a design build architect who's on the team. Yeah, good question. Hope I answered that question correctly. All right, so uh, as it pertains to what your goals are for the construction project. Oh, yep. The LaDonna? No, I was going to say, um, if it's a team, what does that team consist of? Are you talking about the architect, oh. the general contractor, and somebody else? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so I, what I was saying, team, yeah, your general contractor, uh, the architect, any other subcontractors, like a project engineer, they may be a part of one organization. And if that's the case, a lot of times the, uh, the architect cost is a little bit cheaper on those line items. Whereas if you went with two different organizations, uh, a group for your one organization who's your general contractor and another organization separately who's your architect, you may end up spending a little more money uh, versus having them all work for the same company. Hopefully that makes sense for you. Yeah. So, so that's correct. Okay. Uh, so what, what are your goals with the construction project? Right, you should share your thoughts. You're open. So look, when you're talking to your architects, you need to let them know the honest truth about what you're envisioning, right? Regardless of how you feel like it might sound to them, because their goal is to uh, tailor your vision for reality as it pertains to legalities, right? Uh, and you may be surprised exactly what you're envisioning can be built, but you want to know whether or not it can be before you sign off on any um, agreements with the architect or, yeah. You know any design features you want to know that it's uh it's possible to go through permitting that's what it's going to come down so can this design get through the city's building and planning department approved the architect will know the answer to that question if they're really good All right how is the building going to be used uh, again you should mention the purpose of the property is to you know maybe it's to flip it maybe it's to rent it out but they need to know that Again, because there are certain design features that they have to incorporate if you want to be renting it out uh, to save to protect you from getting in trouble with the rent boards of these cities. For example, in the city of Richmond, we uh, at the time we had a triplex property, and the deck that I was referring to earlier on for that triplex needed seismic bracing. Now it wasn't shaking; it didn't have uh, issues you can see just from the look of it or from the walk on it, but because we were we had tenants, right? We had to abide by certain uh, rules to rent board that not everyone does, you know, if they're not legally you know, renting out their ADU or their space, okay? But an architect, you work with an architect, you want them to know that you're going to be renting it out so they can protect you uh, with the law later down the line. So no one's knocking on your door and saying, hey, is this size would be braced? Uh, did you update the electrical features of this entryway, right? All of that's important. So you need to let them know you're going to rent it out, right? Uh, and in terms of the structure, if you have, a, again, if you have a vision, share the direction because it's going to be helpful with the design, but they, they're going to be tailoring your vision, all right? And I would also let them know how much you want to pay. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that how much you want to pay is going to be directly aligned with your vision for the design. But it is important to let them know how much you wanna pay because if you give them a budget, they can better tailor your design to your budget, which is really cool. And Gloria, I believe you wrote, you have your hand raised? Yes. Yes, I had a question about um, how you feel about pre-approved um, architectural yeah. designs uh, for ADUs at the city level. Super excited about those. So Gloria, thank you for bringing that up actually, because we actually have uh, three designs for the key stack that we're working to get pre-approved through the city of Oakland. 
just so you know, you all, Gloria, right, there are already some pre-approved plans through the city of Oakland. You can find them on their website, and actually, we can send that link out to you all after tonight. Um, the reality of it is, those pre-approved plans will get approved through permitting faster. So that's why we're trying to work to get our pre-approved designs. Uh, well, that's why we're working to get our free designs pre-approved through the city of Oakland. To answer your question, it will speed up the timeline. I love when I see folks are able to work with those pre-approved designs, uh, but also if they're you know, if you all are willing to tweak that design that's pre-approved a little bit already, right? Tweak it, and then you know most of it's pre-approved. It's going to speed up your timeline, right? Now a lot of this does come down to staffing. Like for the city of Oakland, they're short-staffed. Uh, we have a relationship with them, so I hear what's going on. They're short-staffed, uh, and, and especially since the new mayor came in, uh, they're working to rebuild that staffing power, right? Um, and that will affect it as well. But in general, that pre-approved design, oh yeah, it helps tremendously. It's a great question. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking in the chat. Is there usually a cost for a general contractor to come out and provide a quote? Yeah, and when do you decide if you need an architect? Great question. Uh, yeah, there, there is, a, not always, but usually a cost for what I would call a site assessment, right? And this is part of your pre-development cost. Uh, sometimes it's a couple thousand, a couple hundred, right? But a lot of times, if you pay it up front, we can reimburse you all in our program if you all want to leverage a pre-development uh, loan pool, just so you know it, right? Um, and we've sent information out about that. We can make sure we resend that out. But yeah, that's usually a cost associated with that. Sometimes your contract will come by, though, and, and do it for free. Yeah, sometimes there's a cost associated with it. Just depends. And then the other part of your question when do you decide if you need an architect early on early on i'll tell you this if you have not yet submitted plans and a, meaning a design to the building department of your city i will use an architect right uh the moment you decide to bring on a general contractor is also when you should be thinking about your architect because you want to know whether or not that general contractor has an architect in house or you have to find one Okay. And it's, it's always my favorite for you all to work with general contractors who are design build and have architects in-house. It is usually cheaper. And like I said early on, uh, they already have a relationship. And a lot of times that can speed up your timeline as well. Right. Okay. If you're um, doing a remodel, should you bring on the architect first or the general contractor to determine like how much it's going to cost? Great question. Uh, you can potentially bring them on together. That's what, that's what I would do. So I would start with the general contractor, right? And in that vetting of the general contractor, you ask them whether or not they have in-house architects, right? Because that's who they're going to need to leverage to, to give you a quote on the redesign. Um, so I would bring them on together at the same time. I wouldn't... Uh, Roughly a 10-mile stretch. There shouldn't be a gap in bringing them on. It should be either together um, or you know whether or not, you know, you... Yeah, I, I wouldn't really recommend that you do it separately um, because like I said, the, the, the architect should be in-house with the, the general contractor. If they're not, you should know that from the get-go um, and we should be bringing them on after the general contractor, right? Who lets you know like, hey, I don't, I can't give you information about your design. We need to bring on an architect. Okay. So I would do it together. Okay. They both should be working with you around their design, whether it's a remodel, or it's a ground up development. Okay. Um, so what else should we be prepared to tell the architect, right? When we're shopping for one, uh, how you want them to help you, that's super important. So this kind of goes back to what I was saying, right? Sometimes your original contractor can help you with these items, but a lot of times they need an architect to support them with it, which is why design build organizations are popping up everywhere, right? You're more than likely going to start with the general contractor, um, but they're going to have gaps if they don't have an in-house architect. They're not going to be able to speak to project design. Um, they may or may not be able to help you with monitoring this project. It may be easier for them to leverage an architect to do that, Okay, uh, but this is all based on you all's goals. Oh, thank you, LaDonna. Yeah, great questions. And I love your question, you all's questions. Thank you. 
Yeah, so the, I mean, it really comes down to you all's goals. But again, you're going to start with that, that contractor and they'll let you know like what skill sets they have. You should be vetting them for their skill sets. Uh, and a big one is whether or not they can help you with the design. More than likely, they need an architect, though. More than likely. And they, and they usually, well, almost always will tell you that, right? I don't have an architect or I do have an architect that can help with design. Uh, and also, just so you know, more times than not, a general contractor is going to come to you and ask you, you know, do you already have a, a layout plan, a design for your ADU, right? And you can say, no, not yet. And they'll say, okay, do you already have uh, an architect? If not, I have someone who can help you. Or they may say, I don't really have it on my team. You need to get that. And then that means now you got, you got to go back to the architect or us really, right? Key equity. We will help you guide but navigate that whole uh, relationship. Okay. All right. So along with, you know, the other items we discussed about, you know, what you should tell your architect when you're shopping for one, you should also be prepared to discuss how you plan to pay for the project. Uh, and if you have it, share it, right? Your desired timeline is super important. You may not have this. You might be leveraging your contract and architect to give you that timeline. And that's okay. But if you have a desired timeline, that's super important. Maybe, maybe you say, you know, I want an uh, accession dwelling unit and I really want it up uh, within six months. Is that possible? Super important that you, you say that. And they can, they will give you an honest answer. They should be, right? Not always, but they should. Why? Because you all are going to be going into contract with these folks. Uh, and that timeline is going to go within the contract. So if they don't meet that timeline, you know, there can be issues. Okay, potentially. Uh, but I say potentially because, you know, projects do frequently take longer to complete than estimated, right? So always allow extra time. Always know when you're receiving an estimate of time versus something finite. Your contract is probably not going to give you a day that's going to be done. They'll probably say, give, they'll give you a range. They'll say like, hmm, six to seven months or six to eight months to get this completed. Why? They do not work within the city's building and planning departments. And a lot of times permitting takes the longest. They know they can build your ADU in, in two months. They know it. But they can't start to put a shovel in the ground until the city says, you're all good. We're okay with your design. Right? That can take, uh, I mean, a varying amount of time depending on the staffing level of the city or sometimes the time of year. Sometimes bringing on a new mayor into the city affects that time of city's building and planet, planning department's ability to get projects pushed through, right? So those are all things you should be aware of. All right, cool. Now, when you need to pay this architect, what are some things you should understand? How they plan to charge you, meaning what's their fee schedule and what fees are covered. They should be breaking down the, so again, after this presentation, I'm, I'm gonna give you all an example of what an architectural estimate looks like, a really good one. It should be line item by line item broken down, okay, around what fees are covered. Different architects will charge for different things, especially depending on whether or not they are uh, on the team of a general contractor or not. Uh, but every line item should have what is being, what, what you're paying for and what that fee is uh, directly, right, on that one line item. And then there should be a total at the end of that. So I'll share an example with you all um, in, the, in the email that gets sent out. Now, these are some common payment structures for architects, right? Lump sum. Uh, you pay your tenant $12,000 or your $6,000 up front based on estimated hours, right? So you say, okay, it's going to take you 20 hours to manage this project and do your design and get it through the uh, and submit it to the planning department. Uh, we'll pay you this much for 20 hours based on your, uh, you know, your lump sum cost. Then they may have an hourly charge, though. Right, so based on that twenty hours, you may times it by whatever there are hourly charges. Uh, you know, different architects will charge different ways, um, but in general, a fee is a percentage of the total building project cost. So they're not charging you up front; it's a piece of what they're charging you. Right, and e again, uh, each fee should have its own line item. You should know what that amount is get, is going towards. Okay, I will say the last architect I worked with, they didn't charge us a lump sum, and they. So I'll say that they didn't charge us a lump sum. Uh, they split the project into phases. 
So they said pre-construction phase one. They said, um, yeah. So they said the pre-construction phase one. They said obviously the initial construction phase is the, 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 the other phase. And then they had a follow phase where we did the, the project walkthrough. But aside from that, uh, that phase chart, so they charge us based on each phase, like 2,000 for this phase, 3,000 for the middle phase. Uh, and I can't remember the total amount for the final phase. But uh, to add to that, they also charge us at an hourly rate for the uh, for the project monitoring, right? So I can't remember what the, the fee was, but uh, we ended up paying like an extra 1500 for the hours that they did what we call project administration. So speaking to the building and planning department, speaking with the uh, general contractor about design, uh, submitting paperwork to the city, right? Those are administrative features that we were charged hourly for. Now that was just our, our, our architect. It just depends, but you want to know how you're being charged. That's all we're saying. Know how you're being charged. And yeah, that should be in the contract too. Now, if you're doing design build, it'll all be in one contract. This is why we really like design build. But regardless, it could be in the contract. Because these, yeah, they like to change stuff on you if you don't. Okay. Um, no matter how much, no matter how much you like them, right? They're really, really good, but things happen. And sometimes they, we all forget things, right? So if it's not within a, a binding agreement, stuff can uh, happen that makes you really, really uncomfortable, okay? And it would suck for it to be related to fees, trust me, right? So fees should be inside a contract as well. And of course, along with our due diligence, we're going to make sure the architect's insured. Uh, and then you all may be listed as the additional uh, insured. Uh, potentially, but in general, there are, and you'll get this again at the end of the slide, but you'll get this, but there are certain insurance requirements that your, not only your architect, but your general contractor must meet as well. Um, sometimes it relates to commercial vehicle liability insurance, right? Meaning, you know, if they're going to be driving to and from the site, ensuring they have insurance, that they're going to be transporting materials, ensuring they're, that they're issued for that, but also uh, the architect and the general contractor just to make sure that the subs that they bring on uh, are covered under some sort of insurance, right? Cool. All right, so interfacing with your contractor, uh, I would also see architect and city and county inspector. So this is a really good one, right? Uh, when you're doing things legally, and you're gonna legalize city inspectors and county inspectors will come by and check stuff off. And a good contractor, but also a good architect understands all the elements that the inspectors are trying to identify uh, when they're checking their list off, okay? Now, in my experience, uh, the contractors in the city of Oakland are really, well, they've been generous for the most part from what I'm seeing. Same for the city of Richmond, but that's just not always the case. You don't know what inspector you're gonna get is what I'm saying. Uh, you don't know what inspector you're gonna get. Uh, this is why within our program, we're highly encouraging you all to follow the legalities that we are putting forth to you all to save you some of the uncomfortable conversations, right? Uh, but in general, a good architect and contractor are going to save you from an inspector who's looking for issues, right? And let's say you have an inspector come by with questions. Well, you know, your contractor and architect should be prepared to help you answer those questions. Um, and really, they shouldn't be asking questions if your design was permitted correctly. It's always a potential. There's always a potential. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's say you get your design permitted, the city of Oakland, and you start to uh, begin pre-construction, right? Uh, you're starting to uh, demolish structures or uh, dig holes, right? And then, uh, there, there's an inspector that comes by, right? Because they're, they're aware of the project, they just come by and they see an electrical fixture is out of whack. Well, then they may try to halt your project, right? Um, so what I'm saying is unforeseen problems in design may uh, force you all to redesign your project or work with your architect and that, that inspector in the county, right? In the city to um, fix whatever issues they're seeing, right? and go back and get it approved 
uh, to make it legalized, right? But things will come up and you'll have to sometimes redesign your design, okay? Now, we'll say this. This is rare. What usually happens is when your architect and original contractor submit plans to the building and planning department of the city, again, your building and planning departments are going to respond with comments on that design. So that's where they should be highlighting any unforeseen problems. But sometimes the inspectors are sticklers, right? They'll come by and they're doing their job. They'll come by and highlight something that uh, was skipped over potentially. Who knows, right? And that can necessitate, necessitate you all having to redesign your uh, ADUs, right, with your architect potentially. Okay. Um, but again, this should be avoided if you know you you have the the right conversations up front with your architect and and general contractor. Is there a cost for our program? No, there's no cost for our program, right? Um, you all are spending your, your your money to build your ADUs, right? There's no cost for our services. Um, yeah, the only cost you didn't are the costs to build your ADU. So, yeah, cool. And we and we try to negate as much of those costs as possible. By the way, right? That's why our biggest uh, product is that financing tool. Well. Um, the, the first and second lien products that we talked about last week. <clears throat> Project monitoring. Um, so a, a part of what you're gonna get after the call is obviously a resource list, right? That you'll see on the slide deck uh, at the end. But a part of that resource list is a vocabulary term sheet, right? And project monitoring is a part of it because we want you all to be familiar with these different concepts and different uh, ideas when you're having discussions with the general contractor or architect, we just, we just want you all to feel empowered to use them, right? But, it, uh, but in general, an architect should be supporting you all with monitoring your projects. This is gonna help you avoid delays. It will help you ensure progress on the actual construction. But like I said, knowing the lingo of construction and what reasonable practices looks like, uh, it should be a part of not only the architect's skill set, but yours so you can hold the architect accountable. Right? Because if you don't know the language, you, you're not gonna always know whether or not the architect is operating in good faith, right? That's what we're here for. I'm gonna keep saying this, but you all should be coming to us, man. Anytime you have questions, concerns, please come to us, all right? About any stage of your process, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what, uh, in working with your architect, what are some things you, you can do to, that will uh, save you, that will protect you later in the case that something negative happens. The first one we've talked about a bunch, but we really mean it, put project details in writing. You should all be having contracts with all of these uh, contractors and architects. So it should be in writing, right? That could be the writing, but any lines of communication as well, uh, if you need that documented, make sure you do. Uh, and that kind of goes into the second one, right? Keep copies of all communications with the architect. And it also goes for inspecting kind of all of these folks. And we spelled, we spelled that, et cetera. But all these folks keep uh, copies of those communications. I love emails. They're easy to track, text to. But obviously, you're not going to be able to email or text your contractor if something's super important in the moment. Have that phone conversation and ask them to send you an email for your records and say that. You mind sending me a follow-up email for my records? They should be okay with that. You're paying them. So stay organized. Even a small project can have many, it will, can have many moving parts. The reason I keep going back to that that uh, two story deck I built not too long ago is because I didn't expect that deck to be as complicated in moving parts, right? And we we got through it and navigated it, but you know, at one point, my like, man, are we building a structure? Are we building a new uh, ADU? Are we building a three bedroom, two bath? Sometimes, right? But if you don't know what's happening, it can feel that way. Uh, okay, so do your homework. Spend time carefully thinking about your budget for the project and your goals, right? Before you talk to an architect, and that's what you're when it comes to us for, uh, obviously your general contractor can support that as well. But I will say this, it's nice to have that before you talk to an architect, but sometimes your architect's going to help you come up with that and they are ready to do it. It's great if you can do it before because they make their job easier, but make them do their job. Make them help you come up with that, okay? That's okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's like, I, like I said, it's very good if you have your own goals before you, let the architect make your goals. Like you should know why you want an ADU, why you want that design, what you're looking to do. And they should be able to support you in meeting your own goals, okay? 
Cool. Uh, and be as detailed when mapping out your ideas. Again, when you're having these conversations with them, uh, not just in writing, but verbally, tell them everything you have in your mind. Everything. You don't want it to come down the line and like, man, I wish I added this onto it. It looks so nice, right? That probably was possible. It's harder to course correct later down the line than it is to incorporate in the moment. So um, be open about what you're looking to, to build. Okay. And again, you should always have a contract with your architect, not just your general contract with any of these folks, right? So uh, that contract should indicate what the architect's role is. Remember, you might have a contract, the same contract for your architect and your general contract because they're design build. That's the case, regardless, within that contract, it should explain what the job of that architect is within a design build company, right? At each stage of the project. It also helps you discuss various uh, variables ahead of time, um, such as the architect's availability, the days that they're off, whether or not they work on weekends. Uh, you wanna get all that from your architect, right? Um, so change orders, right? That, a change order is gonna occur anytime a general contractor architect needs additional materials, uh, is experiencing something on a project that results in additional money that you're gonna have to dish out. That's a change order. That needs to be in writing, it needs to be in the contract that explains what's the course of action that occurs for change orders. How many change orders are allowed? What's the amount? How much, how many can occur? Right before it's like, okay, the contractor has an issue, right? Um, typically what you'll see contractors do is place a cushion or what I've seen some call an escalation clause within their estimates for that to happen. Uh, for example, during the summertime, you all, it is more expensive to build than it is in the winter in general, right? For sure in the Bay Area. Uh, one reason for that is because vendors, raise their cost of supplies, right? So it's not the general contractor. It's sometimes the wood vendor and maybe their, their metal supplier. I've seen these folks add a 5% clause into the amount they're charging contractors, which then results in your contractor charging you more to make up for that 5% cushion. So what you might see a contractor do is charge you 20% cushion, which is good for you. Don't get alarmed that the price is a little higher. Thank them in a way, right? That they're saving you heartache later because you're not gonna be thrown off and neither are they that the wood costs more in the summertime from the wood vendor than it does in the winter, right? That 20%, it's never gonna surpass that more than likely. So, um, and they're not gonna have to use that entire 20%, the contractor, but they, you know, they have wiggle room now for costs to increase, you know, due, due to unforeseen circumstances. Another example, if you are building into an older building, like a lot of the buildings in the city of Richmond and Oakland, for example, once you start to dig into them, more issues arise. Mold, mildew, uh, seismic bracing issues. You can't see that stuff until you tear off the stucco. So you may have gotten an estimate for a certain amount of work. Well, hopefully your architect and contractor were good and put a 20% cushion onto your estimate in the case that once they start to dig into those outside walls, there are more issues that cost you more money you have wiggle room to go up, right? And you'll know what that uh, protocol is. It should be labeled as a line item. Like, okay, this is just uh, additional an additional cushion just in case price prices go up, okay? And again, when we send that out to you, you'll see that included in an estimate. So here are uh, some places uh, that you can leverage, right? to that your your architect and and in your your uh general contractor so you have the the licensing board's website not the cslb website you can also use that here's another link to a separate website you can use to check someone's license that works it's the california state the california architects board um very similar to the california state uh licensing board as well right but you can use them to check those licenses they're super accurate uh, I guess the last year, just 
some reminders for you all. Shop around for multiple quotes for your project. Don't just go with the first contract and the first architect. Uh, again, like we talked about earlier, when you are vetting your contractors, talk to their references and their subcontractors. You can do the same thing for the architect. Talk to folks who have leveraged them. For the architect, you might talk to their actual general contractor that they work with to get an idea of uh, their ability to work with building and planning departments, maybe. Right. And uh, it's a great idea to have the, the architect and general contractor submit a criminal background check. Also, you can find these things on the websites that we, we share with you all. Uh, if they had criminal issues, you'll find that listed on their bond um, once you run up to the state licensing board's website. So you type your license number in. Okay, so those things will come up. They won't be hidden from you. Okay. Second, we have someone entering. All right. Uh, now, all right, contracts between yourself and the architect. And I'll say this is very... Is very similar to uh, your general contractor. Again, it may be this, the same contract for both. If they are a design build, you want all the signatures by all the parties, yourself and the architect, but also the general contractor, if they're going to be involved uh, in that relationship and any services that are provided, uh, but also listing out who's going to be doing what and when. That's super important. Okay. Your contract should also include the price of the project, project start and end dates, total cost and the protocol for change order. So if there's an increase in cost, what's the protocol, okay? Now, you don't have to use contracts to do this work. A lot of people don't, but we're not gonna recommend that's the case. We're always gonna recommend you use a contract with any builders because, because of the long, long-term long effects, man. Like it, it really can affect you all by not getting these, again, permitted and using licensed folks and going into written contracts with these licensed folks. Those small details are super important. All right, uh, so what can the California Architects Board do to you all, right? So we just talked about the C, uh, the CAB, okay? But what can they do? Uh, as it pertains to your, your relationship with your architect. They can uh, discipline the architect if they identify issues, right? And that disciplinary action can look like fines, license suspension, or they can revoke the license. Uh, but obviously before they do any of that, they'll, they'll be investigating your complaint. Civil injunctions, right? We'll take them to court if you need to. Um, and they can refer your, uh, the case to the district attorney's office for criminal prosecution. So it can get very serious. Uh, and these are the types of problems that the board cares about. Unlicensed practicing, fraud, misrepresenting qualifications, and just incompetence, right? I would say these are fairly broad, um, but they are experienced a lot more often with unlicensed folks. So they shouldn't be pretending to be licensed. You shouldn't get any fake license numbers. Instant cause for uh, probably for a civil injunction. Now I don't wanna say that, but more than likely, right? Okay. So we're, we're getting near the end of the presentation. But uh, before we end, I want to also talk about really quickly uh, a non-architect, right? And what they're allowed to help you with, okay? So current California law does not, uh, does not allow people who are not licensed as architects or registered as civil or structural engineers to design certain types of buildings or portions of buildings, right? And this is not all buildings, this is just the ones that we're going to talk about, right? And these include single family dwellings or conventional wood frame constructions. Multiple uh, dwellings contain no more than four dwelling units. Uh, and all these need to be in a wood frame construction, right? If you are using other materials, they expect you to be licensed, right? Uh, um, well, I'm sorry. All of these refer to <laughs> uh, wood frame construction, right? To, to build wood frame construction, you should be licensed, okay? Because there's, there's a lot of uh, just legalities and risks that go associated with that. So you'll notice that's a common term, wood frame construction, right? But also garages and other structures added onto dwellings of wood frame construction that are uh, not more than two stories in basement in height, okay? Uh, so what is a non-architect? What's the, the, the phrase for a person who's a non-architect? That's a drafts person, okay? So which again, uh, at the end of this presentation, we're gonna send you all a list of resources. We'll, we'll view the list in a moment. A part of it is a vocabulary sheet. Uh, one of the terms is a draftsperson. 
right? This is a non-licensed person who's not an architect, but they can't perform many of the design duties and they can't work with a general contractor and they are cheaper a lot of the time, right? A lot of times they design things like decks, uh, small developments, right? But in general, where you are, I'm going to highly recommend you leverage an architect, right? And there are laws associated with drafts people in uh, California. Um, but as you see, these are, I see a, a hand. These are items that uh, folks who are not licensed, right, can design, okay? Um, Julius, yep, I see your hand. Um, so let's say, okay, a drafter or designer, do they have to get approval by a licensed architect for these drawings or this is just what they're allowed to do? Great question. So this is just, just what they're allowed to do. Now, if they want to do other things, yeah, they'll need approval from a licensed architect. Does that answer your question? Yes, that makes sense. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So that is the case. Sometimes uh, an architect will bring on a drafts person to do their work, but that's because the architect can sign off on them being able to do that work, right? Uh, if they're not going to be using an architect, this is all they're actually uh, able to do, right? And it needs to be wood frame construction. So if you want to get more complicated, and wood frame construction is probably the most simple and most common type of construction. If you're going to be using some other creative design, yeah, they expect you to be licensed, right? And uh, once the designs get much bigger, too, the single family, and more than four, uh, more than four units, five plus, oh yeah, you need to be licensed, right? Because of so, the so, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, to, so do you still need a bond if you're the one of the, the drafter or the, or, or the designer? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, they should have, they can have insurance, but it's typically not required that they have those requirements, unfortunately, right? And that's kind of the risk you take on um, with working with the drafts person, right? The architect's gonna have more state requirements to supporting you. And that's why I would highly recommend you, You're going to be more protected, honestly, to work, uh, in working with an architect. Great question, man. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, y'all. So let's keep going. Hope I didn't confuse anybody too much. You know, uh, again, I'm going to send resources out. You can uh, come to office hours once we have them again. You can send me emails, uh, call me. Uh, Charles as well as is available, uh, but uh, part of what you're going to get after this presentation is an example of state enforcement, right? Um, you know, if the state is forcing maybe to tear down your uh, ADU if you did something illegal, that's an example of potential state enforcement, right? There are other examples as well, but we'll send an example of what that can look like for y'all. Uh, a glossary of the vocabulary terms that we kind of uh, glossed over today right, with full descriptions of what these things are and what they mean, um, what the, the things that must be in the contract, we'll send you a list of that. Uh, insurance and bond requirements, we'll send lists of those items out. Where to find an architect, uh, we have some places you can find architects as well, and then questions to ask these folks that you're preventing to be an architect, okay? And I believe we have other resources as well that are going to be sent out uh, in addition to these, but these are for sure the ones that uh, we know are included. I'm going to stop my share and see if there are any questions. I appreciate you all for sticking <laughs> sticking back. I know we uh, went a little over. If there are any questions, I appreciate you all. 